uh, webinar. Quite an interesting one, I must say. Um, as we allow people to come into the meeting room, um, we can just go through some housekeeping rules. Uh, we'll request that everybody remains on mute, please, until um, the end of the session. We will have a Q&A session with um, the speakers this evening. So if you have any questions, please put them on the chat box. Um, if you feel that you really must ask a question, raise your hand and perhaps we'll give you an opportunity to be able to ask your question. So we'll start off in the next uh, minute or so. I see quite a few people are coming in. So Karibuni Sana. Okay, Hannah, are we okay now? Yes, we are. Okay, so I, I guess we can start. <clears throat> so good evening once again, and uh, welcome to the Women on Boards uh, webinar. We are so delighted to have you this evening. I know it's a Friday and we could have easily been in several other places, but we thank you that you have been able to join us today. My name is Rose Sang. I'll be moderating um, today's session. And we are joined by um, various speakers who are not new to us. Um, they've been speaking on several sessions. Um, and these are Patricia Ethau, who is um, <clears throat> our brand ambassador as Women on Boards. But she's also the regional director, East Africa, Stanford Seed, the Stanford Institute of innovation and, and in developing economies. We also have Martin Odwar, Dr. Martin Odwar, who is um, the chairman and CEO of Leadership Group Limited, but also a champion um, of diversity, including uh, you know, women on boards. He has done quite a few trainings as well as coaching sessions for us. So interesting conversation, glad that we have both male and female discussing the interesting topic on boardroom dynamics. Do we serve that tea or not? And if we do, how do we do it? And if not, how do we say no? And so to kick us off, uh, we have Emma Kithinji, who's with us uh, this evening. I'll give an opportunity to share her experience. Um, Emma is uh, a champion of uh, Women in Public Service, an initiative they're currently launching. She's also a member of Women on Boards, uh, membership committee and works for KESRA, which is um, the um, Learning and Development Academy for KRA. Before I give her the floor, allow me to um, give my story. So the year is 2004. I am slightly just under 30 years old. I get to be appointed to lead the HR team in an organization called Finlay's. This is a company that's based in Kericho, doing both tea and flowers. Um, I sit on the leadership team, only female, under 30. The gentleman across the room, average age is 50 years. Now, please note, I grew up in Kericho. So this gentleman possibly brought home the one diapers at the time, but napkins. You know, some of them took me to school. So here we are, Tuesday mornings, that's when we had our leadership meetings, and we'd have them at seven o'clock. And of course, there was always that question around, my daughter, please serve me a cup of tea. Oh, na usiweke sukari, mama amenikataza. You know, those were the conversations. So the question for me today is, do you say no? in which case I'm sure my father would have gotten a call after the meeting to say what a daughter they brought up. In any case, they would have probably shown up at home at four o'clock and asked me to serve the tea anyway. So should I have served the tea on that boardroom table or said no? And if I did say no, what would be the implications? So for me, that was my dilemma and still is. Um, so Emma, I'll give you the floor to share your experience 
at least you don't have the benefit of having had the gentleman around the table uh, bring you up. So let's hear from you. Emma, go ahead. Emma, can you hear me? Oh, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, good, evening. Experience. good evening. Um, I'm honored to be here. And uh, my experience is very different. You know, I joined women on boards network when I was a young girl. I can say, well, quite a young girl. And every meeting, I'd hear Catherine say, when they ask you to serve a cup of tea, just tell them, how old do you like your tea served? Maybe you can show me. And I thought that was very ridiculous. Who can tell you to serve a cup of tea? Fast forward, in 2019, I was in a boardroom. Being the youngest lady, the waiter came in to serve the team. And so the chairman said, um, no, this is not your meeting. Uh, we will serve the team. And he left. I had Emma serve as the team. I was in shock. First, I didn't know if I should serve. Should I serve the team or should I not serve the team? I kept remembering the conversations that I had on women on boards and I was like, oh my God. Anyway, I had to serve the tea. I had to write the minutes, but I served the tea. I served the tea because I could not say no. I didn't, so if I say no, what happens? But the whole of that meeting, I was so distraught. I, it has stayed with me until I wrote my article and Catherine came to my rescue. So I am honored to be here to hear what I should have said. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Emma. Uh, I'm sure the matter will be put to rest today. So at this juncture, allow me to invite Patricia. Patricia has sat on several boards. Um, I'm sure this is not a topic that's new to her. So Patricia, we'll give you a moment to share your experience with us and perhaps give us your thoughts around whether to serve the tea or not. Karibu sana. <laughs> this is a very difficult one because I think I've had opportunities um, to do both um, because as, as described over here, um, sometimes it's very, very difficult as you've described Rose. Um, it's sometimes very, very difficult in the circumstances you're in because you're, you appear almost um, rude. But let me share my own experiences. Um, when I started as an exec and a lot of times also being uh, the only female in, in that particular team. What I did right from the beginning is I'd make sure I'd sit the furthest away from the tea. So that by the time anybody else, anybody's asking you to serve it, they realize it actually doesn't make sense to make you walk if you're sitting at that end to walk all the way to where the tea and they're right next to it. So the tactic I took was charm offensive because I realized that I intended to go um, or to start the way I wanted to go. Um, I recognized that if I did it the first time, you set a particular precedent. And then the next time you say, no, you either appear rude or you know people think now, what is this? So the charm offensive um, strategy that I took would be I'd sit down, make sure I sit the furthest, and um, when people start to talk about tea, I would very quickly say, oh my goodness, whoever is going to do it, please, I do not take sugar. Um, same tactic that the men use. And, you know, people will be looking and saying, so what do you want about? And so there'll be a bit of silence. And after there's a silence, people start getting up and, you know, doing it, doing once, and you can see the discomfort. But I was very clear that um, if I didn't do that, then eventually what happens, because our natural default as women is to serve. If you come into my home, I will serve you. If I'm in a less, more casual situation, my natural instinct is to serve. Whether I'm serving you as a man or serving you as a woman, the natural instinct is the hospitality that you have to serve. So trying to, um, uh, you know, to get away from that muscle, which is really inbuilt in you, is what we as women then struggle with when we get to a board. Having said that, there have been boards where I serve the tea. 
And the reason I do that is because in the same frame that I expect a man to do it, then I should also do it. So once a system was established that I am not the tea server or because you're the woman, you're the one who's going to serve, then in, later on, I was happy to offer to serve because suddenly now I've created the equality platform. And the fact that each of us are equal as we sit on this table and in our equality means that if we're going to offer anything, if we're bringing ourselves there, we're doing it with the same equal opportunity. So because you as a male colleague have served tea at some point, then really it would appear arrogant for me to not offer the same of you. So that's really been my strategy. Three points. One, I started by saying never sit next to the tea because then it is as a default. And logically, when you start saying you won't do it, you appear rude and people say, but you're next to it anyway. Why don't you bring it? So always sit the furthest away, opposite side of the table from where the tea is. So it seems illogical for somebody to send you when they're next to it. The second thing is a principle that sets the tone from the beginning. Um, start the way you intend to finish. So when you first meet the team, make sure you're never the first one to do that service. But thereafter, be prepared to do it because then you're creating um, the collegiality and the equality in who you are as, as, as uh, team members. And thirdly, um, never forget the fact that in doing that, you understand that there's a muscle that you're changing in terms of who you are, and there's nothing wrong with that. So if one time you do it and the next time you don't, don't feel guilty because that is who we are, or at least many of us are. And you know, there's really no harm sometimes offering, but also learning to sit back and accepting that you need to be served as well. Mm. Thank you, Patricia. Charm offensive, very interesting. So now I know where to sit on that board table. So Martin, um, good to have you with us. So talk to us around the male perspective. So one, why is it important to then have women around the table? And two, as you pick us, and two, as you make the request to serve tea or perhaps you know, pass over the lunch, What's going through your mind? Um, talk to us about the male perspective on this issue. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Rose, and thanks to uh, women on boards for inviting me to this, uh, to this meeting. I always feel at a great, at great disadvantage whenever women on boards invite me because invariably, I'm the only man in the room. I've been trying to look at the list of participants today. And uh, I see that I'm very, very much in that single uh, digit minority again today. So I've got to be very, very careful what I say at this meeting. Uh, fortunately, it's a virtual meeting, so you can't throw things at me. Uh, but, uh, but thank you for inviting me uh, anyway. Well, when Catherine uh, asked me to, to talk about, uh, to come on this, uh, on this call, I actually thought she was joking because uh, I actually wondered why, uh, what this subject was, was all about, was, was about and whether, whether indeed we're going to talk about to serve or not to serve tea or whether we're going to talk about something else. Um, it didn't actually occur to me that it was uh, such a big deal, uh, you know, to serve or not to serve uh, the tea. Um, and so listening to uh, Patricia, uh, I feel much, much better. You know, I feel, re I feel much better that, uh, that I can now talk to this because I sit on a number of boards uh, and I've done so for a number of years now. And I do get served tea uh, on boards by uh, my lady colleagues. But my mindset is such that I don't notice it as a lady serving me tea, you know. In, in, and in fact, the way it happens, uh, Rose, is that uh, the, my colleagues volunteer to bring that tea. So they are probably going for their own tea and say, Martin, can I bring you a cup of tea? And I say, fine, you know, thank you very much for, uh, for, for that offer. Um, sometimes I get up, uh, you know, uh, 
naturally and just walk them to the tea table and we chat as we have that tea. And, and so if you ask me, what's the male perspective of this, uh, of this, you asked two questions actually. You asked why have the ladies around the table in the first place? And then, and then what is uh, this thing about, uh, about uh, uh, the male perspective of, having, of serving tea? On the first one, and that's a very big subject of diversity and, uh, and, uh, and inclusion, and uh, some of it is now constitutional, uh, you know, uh, in terms of gender. And uh, there's also just the fact that, uh, the fact that uh, this is now a big issue and everybody is, uh, is working to make sure that they have the right proportions of diversity of whatever nature, uh, not only gender, but other forms of diversity as, as well. And so if you go back into history, you will find that uh, there are no ladies around, that, around those tables. I mean, as I grew up, uh, both in senior leadership at EXCO level and on boards, there were virtually zero ladies. And, and, and you had the gray, the gray haired men um, you know, around those tables uh, and they enjoyed their company and they probably served each other tea or they had uh, the waiters to serve them tea or somebody else uh, to serve that tea. And as, as, uh, as times have changed, uh, more and more ladies have come onto, onto boards, which is a great thing. And as you said, Rose, I'm a great champion of diversity. And so I've actually on two boards, I have actually felt in the minority. I mean, I was chair of the SOS Children's uh, Villages Association here a few years ago, some years back. And out of a board of like nine people, six were ladies and I was, and there were three men on that board. And I always, I always noticed this because I was, I was not used to being in this minority, but, 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 but that was the case. Uh, today I serve on the board of, uh, of British American Tobacco, BAT with Carol Musioka. I don't know if Carol is on this call, uh, but now we have uh, a, a lady, uh, a chairperson, Rita uh, Kavashe recently appointed. We have Bev as the CEO. So, so, so one lady CEO, one lady chair. Uh, we have Marion Mwangi, uh, who is CEO of, uh, of BOC. Uh, she sits on that board. We have Carol Musioka uh, on the board. Um, we probably have another lady that I'm forgetting. And so we are finding that we are, we are increasingly, the men are becoming minority uh, in this. And I just wonder whether in that situation, uh, the ladies will still be serving that tea uh, or not. But just to say, you know, to the, on, on the tea thing, it's um, part of it is cultural, as, as Patricia says. I mean, as, as we grew up, uh, the ladies spent more time in the kitchen than the men did. Um, uh, the ladies uh, multitask more than we do. And uh, I mean, they just, it's just a gift uh, from that side. And so when it happens in the boardroom, uh, you know, slightly different from what Rose and Emma were saying. Um, it's not that you, Rose, go and serve tea or Emma go and serve tea, uh, but it's some, some natural instinct in ladies just makes them get up and serve this tea. Um, so what I would like to say here is, uh, Rose, is, is really just, you know, as the boardrooms get more and more um, agile in terms of, of, of membership, this is something that is going to go away. I don't think it's going to be something that, uh, that stays there, but historically you must appreciate where Rose was coming from, um, you know, in her village, in their company, everybody knows her, you know, she's the smallest person in the room and therefore she's being sent around. Just like if you reflect back, even today in our own, in, I mean, when, when I'm in my house with my children, I send them around to go and do things. And so being the young person in the room is, is, is actually a challenge. Let me give you a short story, actually, uh, Rose, just for a minute before I stop talking. As a young man, I worked in, uh, I worked in a British American Tobacco, BAT for, in fact, I worked there for 10 years in my very, very early days. And we had this canteen where we, had, we, we went for lunch every day. And uh, in my first week in the company, we went into the canteen. There were probably 60, you know, probably 20 senior managers who used to sit in that canteen. So. I went into this table. I didn't know that there was uh, some pecking order or even an order around how you sit around this table. So I went and sat right at the top of this table uh, and I served myself lunch. And, and uh, 
one chief engineer in that company uh, who came in like five minutes after me or, or, or 10 minutes, he came, stood over me and looked at me and said, Napoli. young man, um, Napoli. what Napoli. are you doing on that seat? And I looked at him, I didn't even know him. Napoli. He said, you know, Napoli. that is my seat. Uh, and so I, I, I politely took my, 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 my plate and moved to the next seat, which was empty, actually. And I sat there and I ate my, 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 my lunch. But just remember what he said. He said, young man. So for him, I was young and I was sitting where I should not have been sitting. And I guess historically, you can relate to a number of these things happening. And Rose, let me stop there. Thank you, Martin. Very interesting. I didn't know you worked for BAT in uh, those years. Uh, so thank you for your thought. So Patricia, um, I know we're talking about tea, but I guess a lot of it is, is about utilization of soft power. You know, as you have the conversations and especially the difficult conversations within the boardroom. Um, perhaps share your insights uh, and thoughts around how you view soft power to be able to sort of get ahead or being able to say no, but in a very well respectful way. The one thing I found, and again, this is where you learn tactics and style and everything else, is how you, um, if you start from a position of saying, of starting to, uh, you know, what is the outcome I want? Uh, from this conversation or from, from the decision that I'm particularly sharing. So a long time ago, I learned this art of saying, what is the outcome I want? So if the outcome I want is for you to know that I'm saying no, but for you to accept that my no is coming from a point of, um, you know, fact, from a fact of, from a point of objectivity, from a point of, um, you, know, uh, you know, no emotion, then it means it's going to be a great outcome. And also from a point of that, you will accept and you'll be very, very supportive of my saying no. So if you start from an outcome based of what you want to achieve from your no, then you come back. Then it allows you, even as you say no, the style with which you say that no. So one thing I've learned is um, from that is really to have a very good assessment of the um, context you're sitting in, the situation you're in and the individuals you're with. You're with. Um, in the same vein that when Martin is speaking about young and old and you know diverse, not diverse, you have to have the emotional intelligence to read the room and understand which style is gonna work and which style does not work. So for example, um, with um, I have had the opportunity to work um, with, with very different um, you know, individuals who come from different um, countries, environments, and really trying to understand the style of those people has really helped me a lot. So with the British, for example, who I, a lot of my career, if you look at uh, Unilever, where I first started, they are British. So how do you say no with a British perspective? They're not direct. They start by giving you the context, the background, and eventually you find out actually they said no, but you're left wondering, okay, do they, they have not agreed to what I'm saying, but the message comes through. To now when I'm with Americans who are a lot more direct and you say, no, I'm not happy with that. And this is a reason. Similarly, when you look at our African context, um, depending on the group you're with, when you're saying no, um, how do you do it? If you're feeling, for example, when I'm younger, I'm with older people, you can't necessarily just say, no, I don't agree. Um, for, for the face of it. You can still get the same firm communication through, but making sure you take into consideration where they're coming from and the fact that you have a position, but in the end you say, it is for that reason that I do not agree with, um, with what you, you are saying. So I've actually learned to temper the way I communicate, the way I message based on the situation that I'm in. And, and that is what they call um, situational leadership your ability to read the room, read the emotional, you know, the, the emotions, the context and everything else, and then apply it in that, in that way. If I'm in a very aggressive situation, very, very aggressive, which is a little bit more patronizing, et cetera, then I can afford to be a lot more firmer, a lot more direct, because that's what it calls for. 
Um, and, and I think your ability to adapt as a woman and your ability to read the room when you're sending your message of no really is where the power lies. Interesting thoughts there, uh, Patricia. So how do you read the room? Because sometimes uh, your perception of what is being sent yeah. and what is being sent are very yeah. different. Yeah. Is it something that comes with experience? Is it something that comes with coaching? And, and how do we do that? Um, I think it is, um, how would I put it? It has come with a lot of experience, to be very honest, because I, when, when I was younger, for example, I was a lot more emotional, a lot more out there, I'd say everything um, that came out. And um, in a way, I also had a very good coach um, in, in somebody called my husband who would sit down and I'd come home fuming about something and not saying anything. And he would help me um, understand things from a male perspective. So I, I had that benefit. And he sit down and say, oh, but you know, this is the way men think. So perhaps if you address it this way, um, the message will come through a lot more and, and kindly and, and without people taking offense. So I think there's, there's a lot of ways you can learn. There's ways you learn from experience. There's ways you learn from coaching. There's ways which as women, the one thing we tend to muffle or suppress is our intuition. So the one thing I also speak to women a lot, um, I've just done the emotional intelligence um, uh, training and in the past I've done, a, I've, you know, I'm a coach. And so I have spent a lot of time really um, saying as women, we have to learn to listen to what is not being said, to hear what is not being said, but to really lean on this inner intuition that we have, which over time we tend to suppress because we're trying to fit in. We're trying to belong. We're trying to... Um, you know, be, be seen um, as, as being present, as, as leaning in, as sitting on the table. So the one thing I urge a lot of women is always stop and think. Listen to that inner intuition of yours. When you are looking around the room, take time to appraise, to listen to what people are saying, to hear what is not being said, and to make sure that when then you speak, you speak to be heard, not speak to just be noticed that I have said something. And sometimes in your silence, it's louder than in speaking um, at a time which is completely inappropriate. So I think it's a combination of all those things, experience, coaching, guidance, um, learning to listen to your inner intuition. All those things are things that come into play in you learning to read the room. Okay. Let, me just, uh, let me just add something yes, there. Yes. Uh, because you know, we are talking about uh, women serving tea here, but actually the point that uh, uh, Patricia is making about uh, reading the room applies as much to ladies as it applies to men. Because remember that the boardroom is, is a meeting of equals, the meeting of people. They, are, they, they may be diverse, but they are actually equal once they get into the boardroom. Uh, they have uh, an agenda to deal with. They have uh, oversight responsibilities to carry out in the boardroom. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, and in this diversity, this is where the challenge also then sits uh, because uh, everybody is coming from a different uh, background, personality, uh, education levels, experiences, et cetera, et cetera. And so part of this is, 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 is really, um, you know, understanding what the culture in that, in that place is, you know, understanding who is in this room uh, and what kind of people are they and therefore when they speak, where are they coming from and, and, and how do I then relate with what they are saying? So there's something here about, uh, about understanding, you know, what is going on inside that room and the dynamics thereof. Uh, and it, is, it, it applies equally to both men and women. And so uh, it's, uh, I like that point that Patricia is making there, but it's a really important point uh, within the boardroom. Uh, so Martin, you bring up uh, something quite interesting here because although you talk about uh, the boardroom being a place of equality, there are conversations that sort of happen at the boys club, if I can call it that, you know, away from, away from the boardroom. So how as ladies, do we um, sort of read from that 
um, you know, do we, do we join you in that boys club? Um, how do we connect in that space? Because it's, it almost sounds as though, you know, you're creating the rules and we are sort of supposed to find a way of, of playing with these rules. Um, so how do we join or get to be part of that conversation without necessarily being in the boys club? So back to the issue around intuition and um, you know being able to read the room beyond the boardroom. So I don't know what the equivalent of the boys club is for 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 ladies and uh, and and where that happens. Um, the so COVID has kind of in, um, equalized all of us because uh, you know the clubs were all closed and nobody was going anywhere, uh, and yet the boards continued working. But uh, to come back to that point uh, again, and, and it's, it's really around for me, it's really around understanding uh, the role, your role as a board member. And forget about gender here, uh, your role as a board member. What is it that uh, you are there for? And, 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 there, and what role therefore are you playing in once you get into that boardroom? Where are the meetings taking place and, 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 and are the decisions being taken at that meeting or are they being taken outside coming back to understanding what is going on inside that room so if you find that you know you are one lady and there are six gentlemen and they're all you know golfing together and having a beer in the evening together at some club uh, and decisions are being made on the golf club then clearly that is something that that needs to come back into the boardroom as a discussion point because you're probably being excluded from many things and therefore your voice is really not being heard and yet you're supposed to ensure that your voice is actually heard there. So can you break into that club and go and join them at the counter and have your drink with them? Uh, I will leave that question for Patricia to answer. But uh, in some of the clubs, you'll also find that there's, there's men's room or men's bar where you cannot enter even if you went to that club. And so that may not help you very much. So it's around having, uh, you know, having another strategy for ensuring that you're not excluded and that the decision-making process is one that is a formal structure that you are able to lend your voice to uh, and, and, and make your contribution in. So let me leave that for Patricia to, to see whether she, she has joined the boys club now or not. <laughs> <laughs> your thoughts, Patricia? Every now and then I had to, but, <laughs> but actually on a, on, on a more um, serious note, I think this is a very, very tough uh, conversation. Um, and I think uh, the one point I want to make is what Martin first started by saying, you're in or you're on that board in, a capacity, in your capacity and because of a contribution you bring, a value you bring, and you should never ever forget that or allow that to be compromised. So if you are recognizing or you're starting to feel that there are conversations that you're not included in. Actually, I would say the, the, the fault is yours if you do not bring it to the attention um, of your colleagues that that is the case and allow your voice to be heard. Having said that, um, I think there you have to also figure out ways how you can uh, get some inclusion. Because sure, there may be six of them and they meet at the golf club and everything else. But what you find is it's usually um, very unlikely that all of them actually do that. And um, as women, I think this way, I again, talk about um, the emotional intelligence, the EQ you bring, your ability to look and to, and to see who is perhaps on the outside who you can get some alliance with. Because if you can build that alliance with that individual, suddenly then you have somebody who gives you um, a second voice to allow you to break up those um, um, clicks and, and, and clusters, which then lead to decisions being made outside of, of your control. So the tactics that I have used are, are that, first of all, um, um, the fact that I never go into a room um, seeing myself as a woman. Um, so Martin also alluded to that. The minute you walk into a place, seeing yourself as, as a woman, then you will tend to play back into those things. And really, that's not why you are there. You're there because you're contributing something. So park that the minute you walk into that boardroom. Come in there with a skill and 
the contribution you're going to bring. Now, if you have that kind of mindset, it means that you're not going to sit feeling like the underbody or you won't feel the, a lot of the insecurities that we build as a woman suddenly start to be set aside. So then I am sitting there, I feel I am here because I'm an equal as a board member. So if I have a sense in the same way in your own home or when you are growing up or anywhere else where you felt outside of a boardroom where you feel that you are not getting, um, you're being discriminated against, you will speak, you'll find a way of, of saying, look, this is not working for me and I need to be heard. So that's the first thing, drop the woman thing as you come in. Come in, if you feel something's a challenge, speak to it. The second thing is now start to employ the tactics and the tactics are figure out who's a person who's not necessarily aligned to all this little boy clicky things. Trying to build alliance with this individual so that you too can create a louder voice to counter the voices of the boy clicky club, if need be. Um, the third thing is um, sometimes you have to, if they're going to the, um, the club, uh, also find a different place where you can invite them if they're willing to be and, and, and to join them. Um, the third thing, if your values allow, why not? If people are saying that, you know, we're having a drink at this particular place, join them within the parameters that you can. I mean, and yes, there are constraints. I mean, you know, yes, you may not be able to stay there all night. You may not be able to, but if you, your, your values and um, your time or whatever allows you to, there's actually no harm socializing once in a while because that allows people to feel that maybe you're one of them. But in the same vein, when you also have a social, invite them so that this is the whole equality thing I start to bring, that it's not always you joining somebody else's party, you're also inviting them to your party. And in, in that, somewhere along the way, we'll all come to the middle and um, we'll align someplace. So I don't know if that is useful and that helps. I, I, my mind is trying to think of all the things I've been through in the last 20 years to try and see the things that I use and what I did. and um, those are some of the experiences I am trying to share. I know, for example, when I was at the brewery, for a long time, I was the only female exec um, on, on that particular team. And, um, you know, I had to learn to, you know, once in a while fit in. Uh, to be honest, I've never, I don't drink beer. I've never enjoyed beer. But would go places and people want to sit someplace and have a beer. I, you know, I could sit down and say, ah, don't like beer, I'm not going to go there. But I'll sit there and, and, you know, chat and join in the conversation. And within that, people started to feel you're part of the team instead of them always having to feel um, there's a different egg in, in the basket. Not, not a woman, a different egg in the basket. And so those are some of the things that I, that I had to do and I admit I had to do in order to make sure that I am I'm, I'm building the collegiality of us as, as a team more than anything else. Um, the second thing is I've also been on boards where there were very strong individuals with a particular agenda, but there were some you could see were not playing the game. And um, the ability to share with them and, and seek an alliance and say, you know what, we need to also have a voice. We need to counter what is going on here. Why don't we present our view objectively so that we have a voice and so that we don't get you know, rubber stamped all along. And that has also been a strategy that, that worked in, in, in a different board that I had. And it, and it was not because um, the other group was um, aggressive in any way, it's because they were too accepting of what this, this center was saying. And I, I believe that we needed to present more of a challenge. So I, identifying somebody who I could align with to present that challenge is something that I recognize the only way I could do it is find somebody who, you know, we could, we were of like minds and we could speak and present our cases objectively and firmly enough for our voice to be heard. I don't know if that helps. Absolutely, so interesting thoughts around that. I mean, I like the fact that both of you have agreed that we're there in our own right, not necessarily as women, but in terms of the skills and the value that we bring to the organization. So, so I, I like that. And Ross, Ross uh, you know, just to, as, as Patricia was, was, was talking, I was just reflecting on, on, on how this, you know, diversity, this, this women thing may play in, in, in the boardroom. 
and again uh you know for me like with anything you going into a new position for people going into board roles for the first time uh clearly there's going to be some hesitation or some confidence thing happening as you enter that room because a you don't know the people you don't know the organization um you are sitting on this board for the for the first time mm. there's some investment here which must be made uh and again it's whether you're a man or a woman but mm. given that women um given that there is perception around women coming from a a position of disadvantage a disadvantaged position i think there's a, there's a sense here in which there's an investment to be made in a you know knowing the dynamics that are happening here b the organization that you are in and what's expected of you um i find things like induction uh, you know as as very strong processes and then just knowing what that organization is all about and the board is all about but also this bonding process that uh, that patricia referred to is quite important opportunities for people just to get to know one another better mm. so that as in my case when somebody offers me tea in my mind it's not a big deal you know she's offering me tea because she's a colleague uh mm. you know and she's having tea sitting right next to me and she's going to the tea table why should she come back with one cup when i'm also perhaps feeling thirsty for tea <laughs> uh, that kind of thing so but building that collegiality as, as as patricia says or that bonding is important and you know after your first board meeting you grow in confidence and 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 as you understand who is who around that table uh you then get aligned to particular forces there that will help you grow in your confidence uh in the boardroom so that dynamics thing is is important now the other thing i mean catherine uh we were running a a session for board members of uh, of state corporations last year uh with Catherine and Catherine said to me that uh that women have got like uh, 10 times multiple of words than than men uh, i don't know exactly I, i can't remember exactly what she said she said that you know she needs to talk like 100 words before i say one word uh, as a man and one of the one of the things that that, that i find uh, in the boardrooms is that uh you know the time for board meetings is very very short and therefore the way that you express yourself in the boardroom is quite quite important and how you then show up uh and at, at the table and begin your conversations will also determine the way people around the, the table begin to relate to you and this is important just as as women on boards network uh, normally teach uh that as ladies going to the boardroom that they also just see how to tame these hundred words of Catherine uh, Musakali so that they are very crisp with the, with the, with the conversation that is taking place there thanks okay interesting thoughts there and, and as you're speaking um something came to my mind so we know that uh, some of the um, appointments through you know government um, mm-hmm. processes sometimes land you in a organization that you're not very familiar with and perhaps some of it is used as a reward for you know um perhaps various initiatives that you have undertaken in the past so here is a young woman or a young lady who has recently been appointed to a board that she knows nothing about perhaps doesn't see um alignment between her competencies and this organization that she's been appointed to so what would be your advice around what that journey would look like for her to quickly land the ropes and shorten the learning curve so that then you know she's able to earn the respect um of her colleagues around that table we can start with uh, you martin and then patricia so Rose, the question you're asking is is how one then gets uh onboarded uh effectively into the the board role is that the question yes especially when uh, we know that you've come in um as as a process through reward where you sort of have to earn your stripes uh within the table so i, I would go back to what patricia said uh, originally that once you walk into that room forget about the process that has brought you in there because once you are once you are in there those guys who brought you there are outside the boardroom 
and you've got to run your own race uh, in, in, in that boardroom. And therefore, the points that I made around, um, around proper induction, um, around boarding, around getting to know who is who around that table, uh, building up your confidence uh, in, in, in that room, you know, forget about how you got into that boardroom because you are now inside there and you're supposed to play the role that you're supposed to play inside there. And so if technically you're feeling, um, you know, kind of uh, inhibited, uh, then you need to, you know, pull up your socks on the technical side as quickly as you can. If um, uh, it's the, the, the confidence game, then again, um, you need to sort of uh, see how to deal with that. Um, and the more, the more you do this, the more you build that confidence uh, as well. But if you come there and every time you're making reference to the person, person who brought you there, then I think you are in for, uh, you're in for a rough time because everybody is then going to basically pass you over uh, on some of the very, very important discussions or decisions that are being made there. Because when they, when they look at you, they see the person who has sent you there and they may not really be li like that person who sent you there. So once you are in that room, uh, Rose, you are your own person. Let me pass it over to Patricia. I think I will respond to this question by giving a real live um, a situation, very recent one for me. Um, a young lady I mentor um, reached out to me because she had been seconded to a board. She's very young, um, soft-spoken, um, tends to speak in a very, very hesit hesitant way, but that's who she is. But she had a lot to offer at this particular board. So. This young lady reached out to me because she said, I have joined this board. They're all men. Um, they all are looking there and saying, you've just been seconded from this other organization. We're not, we're not sure if you're just there to fill the slot or what. But she started to tell me how she would speak and um, it's like she had not spoken. Um, she would say something and um, for the time she's speaking, people would look like, especially the, the managing director would look like they're patiently, you know, doing this, like they're hearing her. And then they would turn and continue to have a conversation as if she wasn't there. And you can imagine what this um, young uh, lady was feeling. And um, I started to ask her simple things. I mean, the softer things, which a lot of um, people don't even tell you. I asked her the question, um, you know, when you come into that meeting, where do you sit? And um, she said, okay, I sit furthest away from this guy who's been ignoring me because I don't want to be near him. And when I, I, I'm near him, I get the angst. I said, okay, number one. And then I asked her, and when you sit, how do you sit? And she told me, okay, because I'm, I'm, I'm really nervous. Sometimes I lean back and I'm sitting like this. And then I ask her, and uh, when you speak, yeah, and you're making your contribution, how do you do it? Have you, have you thought through it? I mean, do you go on? Do you get to the point? How do you do it? And she talked to me and said, now, because I've spent so much time thinking about how I have to make a contribution, um, I'm never sure whether I have been succinct enough, whether I've been to the point, whether I've been firm. And I think this is a story that many, many women can tell. So the first thing I asked is the people who don't listen to you, the first thing you have to do is find a way of sitting someplace where they cannot ignore you. Um, you are there. Whatever you are, whatever they think, whether they think you're young, you've been seconded from this other organization, you have a lot of value to add. In fact, the skill you brought to that board is one that none of them have. And by them not hearing you, they, they're missing a huge opportunity. So the first thing I told her, where you sit. The person who's the most aggressive towards you, who does not listen to you, you have to learn to sit across the table from them. Because then they can't ignore you. They can't turn their side and start to talk to the rest of the table and you're completely left out. Rule number one, these are the simple things. The next thing I advised her is I sat down and said, whatever you feel, this is where you're gonna train yourself to do what the Cheryl book said, you have to learn to lean in, yeah? You cannot be sitting there and leaning back because somebody, 
human beings are animals. They can read fear, they read discomfort, they read lack of confidence. So for you to build your confidence, learn to lean in a little bit. Because when you lean in a little bit, then suddenly your confidence, it gives you the confidence, but also you have more presence and you can be heard a little bit more. The third thing I told her is that make sure you're very, very well prepared when you go into that board meeting. And in your preparation, pick an area that you're very passionate about, that you want to be heard and make sure you speak to it. Because if you spend your time, A, not being prepared, then you go into that meeting and you spend your whole time in your head, trying to find a moment when you can speak, then actually you lose the opportunity to contribute, you lose the opportunity to um, create um, a command of who you are. And that I think is, is the hardest thing you can do. The last thing I told her, which is something that um, only another woman can tell you. If another man tells you this, you'll actually be very, very offended. Very, very, very offended. I told her, as women, the one thing we forget, and I'm going to ask you to ignore the conversations that men have about dress and everything else. Never walk into a boardroom wearing something that makes you uncomfortable. Now, I know a lot of women may cane me for saying this, but it is actually the truth. If you have walked into a room wearing something that you don't feel confident about, and many a time I've observed uh, women who've come in and you know, they love what they're wearing. It was fantastic. It may be a little skirt, which is perfect. They love it. But then suddenly they're in there there, and they spend the whole time pulling it, pulling it, pulling it down. These send signals that you're not comfortable. Yet you wore that because you believed in it and you were comfortable in it. But now you start sending signals that you're not comfortable in it. And then you spend your time, instead of contributing what is in here, you're contributing you know, you're spending more time distracted with things that really don't matter. So these are the soft things I, I really um, can only say because we're in a closed group and we're amongst women. You know, I, I hope it is taken well, but please, um, women, the last, th those points uh, may seem trivial. They may sound um, superficial or, you know, people may laugh them off. But let me tell you, these are things that, can help you, you um, be present, um, have a lot more command, but also come in to contribute and to give of yourself rather than spend a lot of time in your head wondering how do I make my presence known? I don't know what, if there's any response to that. Mm. So lean in, prepare and put on something comfortable. I always wonder whether color matters, does it matter? I don't think so. I think um, if you're confident in, in what you are and where you are and how you are, it doesn't matter. In anything, it's about how comfortable you are in it. Mm -hmm. um, the point I was trying to make is if you're not comfortable in something, people notice you're not comfortable in it. So it completely distracts from what you're going to bring. And that's the last thing you need. You're coming there prepared. You're coming there to add value. You're coming there to speak and you're coming there as, as a person. And as women, I guess, these are some of the things that sometimes um, handicap us and, and don't, don't trip at the finishing line is, is the message that I would give. Okay, interesting. So well, Martin, go on, go on, Martin. You know, fortunately uh, on the question of dress and color, et cetera, men actually don't have a problem because men just have one black suit exactly. uh, and, a, and, and a white shirt. And so uh, they don't struggle with that. But the point that Patricia makes is, is really important. Feel comfortable in what you are coming in with so that it's not a distraction either to you or to the men who are in the room with you. Mm. Okay. I see a lot of men. Anyway, this, should not be, this should not be taken badly. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make it because I've got young girls who keep telling me, oh, no, no, this, 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 why should we? And I say, as women, the most important thing, whatever you do, whatever you wear, just make sure you're comfortable in it. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not comfortable in it, it will show. Mm -hmm. And in a place like a board meeting where you're coming to present what's up here, uh, the last thing you need is distractions. And some of those distractions to yourself is sitting there and everybody knowing you're not comfortable in what you're wearing. Thank you both. 
now I must go and look at uh, those high heel shoes and figure out which ones need to be in the boardroom and which ones don't. <laughs> Sometimes you stand for a long time before the board meeting starts. The last thing you want is to be removing your shoes because you're not comfortable. <laughs> so Martin, I have a question from Anne. She says, um, does it color the perception of the woman on the board if she serves tea? And um, I know you had answered this, but I think she wasn't in the room. Have you served tea before? Does it does it color the perception of women if uh, of uh, a woman if they serve tea? Yes, in the boardroom. Uh, in my in my world, it doesn't, right? Because uh, I see ladies in the boardroom for you know the value that they bring to the board, uh, which is. Uh, which is great value. Uh, I see, you know, I, I've, and, and, and to that point, I mean, I, I've seen women do great things in boardrooms. I've seen them bring order where there was complete chaos, you know. Uh, you know, men are very, uh, the ego, ego levels are much higher than those of women. And I've seen situations where we needed a woman in the boardroom to really cool down tempers in that room because and bring sense among the people in, in that room. I've seen women who bring sobriety in the boardroom just because of the different perspectives that they bring in and the caring nature of, 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 of women and the fact that they can do many things at the same time uh, and, and kind of bring sense. And the fact that you know they generally communicate well, um, they can be very persuasive, uh, and these are qualities which 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 many men may not have uh, in the boardroom, especially where difficult decisions are being taken. Uh, so I've seen them as mediators in 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 the boardroom as well, and so therefore serving tea um, is kind of a distraction actually to a very serious um, engagement here in boardrooms. Uh, it's got to be done. Uh, you know, uh, these days I find, I mean, tea is, is, is already in the boardroom or in the vending machine or something. And everybody walks out and goes and picks up theirs and comes back. Uh, so have I, have I served tea? I don't know, actually, maybe I have. Uh, maybe I have uh, served tea to some of my lady colleagues in the boardroom uh, and maybe to one or two men. It's not something that comes natural, let me say, uh, Rose. I like your candor, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> I like your candor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you see, the other thing which is happening now is that there's so much focus on, on this diversity, inclusion, and discrimination that I think even among the diehard men, they are mm. learning to, to mm. really be careful and be very sensitive to some of these issues. Mm. So I... I would like you, Rose, to just to, to find out in, in today's day and age, mm -hmm. whether men in the bedroom actually would seriously tell a lady, you know, Patricia, go and bring me a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. There would be very, very few, if any, I think. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I cast my eye down 20 years ago or, or 30 years ago, that was probably the norm for the few mm -hmm. women who are in the boardroom. Mm -hmm. No, you're right. Uh, yeah, the conversation around uh, gender uh, has taken a different turn. So yeah, I, I agree with you there. Um, Martin, from your experience, I mean, a lot of the times and, uh, you know, the articles and the books that we read talk about diversity bringing about innovation uh, and, and all matters, you know, productivity. What has been your experience around um, the value that women bring to the boardroom conversation? So, as, as I've mentioned, and uh, you know, I'm not a psychologist. I think psychologists would have much more to say in this in this uh, on this matter than myself, and therefore, I don't. Um, I'm not very much into the space of how the brain works and whether how women's brains vis-a-vis -vis men's brains work, but. From just my practical experience in uh, in boardrooms, what I've seen is that um, ladies bring a lot of candor. Uh, they are very courageous. 
they communicate well, as I've mentioned. Uh, they, they temper the egos of men in the boardroom. Um, they mediate extremely well. On the question of innovation, again, I find that ladies in the boardroom are fairly creative. Sometimes I just sit there and I wonder where this is coming from because you are discussing this matter and there are different points of views that are coming here. The men are very, very, not, not technical, they are very factual about things. So, so, so everything is kind of a straight line here. And therefore, they fail to look at what's around this. And I find that certainly in the boards where I sit, the ladies in the boardroom will always bring in these very uh, innovative uh, perspectives and even ask for, you know, how else things could be done apart from the traditional way that uh, things are being presented uh, in. And so with regard to the point you raised around productivity, uh, around uh, innovation, um, I find a lot of thinking that is going on there from, from and every occasion that I'm in the boardroom, uh, you know, this happens invariably, right? So, so either ladies are reading too much or ladies are more prepared than men coming into the boardroom, uh, or it's just a natural thing that uh, ladies have as they walk in and therefore these perspectives are bubbling in their minds as people are discussing something, there's already ideas you know, jumping up and down in their minds, which they then put on the table, but which are very, very uh, valuable. So I would say, Rosa, that, that perspective thing for me is a big value value um, add that I see in the boardrooms where I sit. And I'm probably lucky that I sit in boardrooms with uh, uh, with ladies who are really, really intelligent, who know their stuff, um, who beat men every day uh, in, in, in these discussions. And so, Maybe this is not, these are not typical boards, but certainly I really enjoy uh, working with the ladies that sit on the boards that I sit on. But those are some of the, the things around the question that you've asked that I would, uh, that I would say, Rose. Um, thank you, Martin. Your thoughts, Patricia, on, on, on that aspect? Are there things that you see uh, typically that women bring to the table that perhaps in only male dominated boards don't? I think Martin has captured a lot of them and you know he has the advantage of being on the outside so his observation is even uh, stronger because he's well, the helicopter he's seeing it from the outside but I think the other thing that I can that that I the, the one thing I really would like to emphasize is the point that he made around um, the alternative view women increasingly bring in the alternative view and um, the minute as a woman, you're very confident of, of who you are, um, you're there to contribute um, without any inhibition, then the thing that comes out is our natural intuition. And that intuition, a lot of times has a lot to it. Um, and um, I think the biggest place where it plays um, is, especially when you're talking people matters. You know, um, your ability to see round, round the block to see what is not being said. Um, I've seen a lot of that and I've seen our ability to do that. Our ability to also, um, in offering the alternative view, um, that also being the, the gentler kind of view because it's our nature, we're, we're nurturing. I mean, as women, um, our natural instinct is, is nurturing. I think that's why we, we were created to bear children because, you know, um, that, that, that instinct comes with that. And so that nurturing spirit comes in when the tough conversations are coming in and an alternative view needs to be presented on, on people discussions because then you're always um, able to say, but perhaps can we look at it this other way? Is there another perspective that we may have missed um, in conversations around reorganizations, uh, re the reorganizations, you know, how do we make sure um, the landings and, and the things we do are um, gentler, um, that people exit kindly, you know, those kind of conversations I tend to feel are, tend to be brought a lot more um, when you have when you have a woman. Um, the other thing that um, women also do is they also see um, the bluffing a lot more. I mean, um, if 
numbers, the, the fudging, you know, if things don't sit right, even if they don't understand it, they don't know it. I, I tend to find that they, they, they'll always have that question mark. They may not know it, but at least they'll have the confidence to ask. Um, and um, I don't know if I'm being um, a little bit um, presumptuous in saying that, but that's something that I've tended to notice um, a lot more. Yeah. Okay. Interesting perspective. So Catherine has a question here. And uh, she says, research has shown that women are interrupted 10 times more than men in the boardroom. How would you advise that women deal with interruptions in the boardroom? I know you talked a little bit about it, Patricia, uh, but perhaps give us your thoughts um, and your experience I, around interruptions. I, I, um, I, I, the minute you asked that question, I went straight to the vice president, um, the vice presidential debate in the US. Kamala? versus Pence, I am sure a lot of you uh, remember that conversation where she sat and she listened and she had him interrupt and interrupt. And eventually with just one stroke, she just was very quiet, looked at him and said, please let me speak. Once I'm finished contributing to this, to this conversation, then you can have your say. And I think women need to identify that opportunity when you say something and it is so memorable. Thereafter, everybody remembers, oh my God, I don't want to do that because, you know, I don't want to be reminded that um, I was not being very polite. So if anybody wants to learn how to stop the interruptions, go and watch that um, debate and see how Kamala did that. And um, I think for me, that's something I've also learned a lot of times, you know, I can listen to interruptions once, twice, but the third time I will just stop and I will tell you that. Um, and, and the other thing is also to do it very quietly, very kindly, but exceptionally firmly. Because the thing is, if you blow your top, people forget the message and the point that you're raising, what they remember is that you blew your top. So being very deliberate about it, being very quiet about it, but being extremely firm in letting people know that they're interrupting you and they need to let you speak and finish and then they can have their say. Let me tell you, if you choose the opportunity right and do it right, you're, you're on the home run. I think, Ross, also the, 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 on that question, I would also advise that uh, or encourage that uh, you know, ladies make use of the chairman or the chairperson of the meeting as well, because even as you, so 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 Patricia's point is is is, is right, uh, and just to say that you haven't finished saying what you are saying, and therefore you need to be allowed to continue, but also you know, uh, as she was saying that you need to to eyeball the person sitting opposite you, eyeball the chairman also because the chairman has got a role here. To ensure that the, the 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 meeting culture is right, and that people are not being uh, interrupted all the time, stopped from speaking, and also to encourage the silent ones to also come up and say something during the course of that meeting, and so that is that is the other angle that I would I would suggest that uh, that if you feel that if you find that you are in that situation, then use that avenue as well, and then after the meeting, I mean, come out and and also say to the chairman, you know. As I was speaking, every, all these men were interrupting me. You know, mm -hmm. uh, can you, yeah, can you just make sure that next time this doesn't happen? Mm -hmm. And if he's a good chairman or a chairperson, he will certainly take that cue and 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 make that that point at the board at the board meeting so that uh, people don't get unnecessarily interrupted. Especially if this is happening to ladies on to women only. You know, mm -hmm. but if there's a rogue guy in the room who interrupts everybody, mm -hmm. then again the role of the chairman there to stop him. Uh, you know, just being a nuisance at the meeting is, uh, is something that should also apply. Okay. So both of you have served in um, various boards in various sectors in various industries. I mean, Martin, we've seen you in manufacturing. Uh, we've seen you in banks. Patricia, you have a marketing background, you know, but have served in, you know, various institutions. Currently, you know, advising business people um, at, at, the, at the Stanford program. 
So what's your advice around knowing the organization and, and picking up very quickly? Uh, because from where we sit, we, we sort of see you as, as gurus, you know, understanding all these sectors. Um, but are there tips around getting up to speed with the business of the organization that you're chairing or being a member of that board? Are there specific areas we need to look into for those of us who are looking to get into these boards? We can start with you, Martin, and then uh, Patricia, you can give your thoughts. So let me uh, give a short story here. Not, yeah, a story uh, just to make the point. So uh, this week uh, I got a call from uh, somebody that I don't know, but who has just been appointed to the board, to a board in the financial services uh, sector. Uh, I think he was appointed in, in June during the, 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 uh, the, the, the COVID period. Um, they've had one board meeting uh, on uh, a virtual board meeting. And so he was, ref he was referred to me, uh, you know, to kind of just ask about these boards, you know, what are they and how do people behave when they're, when they're on boards, et cetera. And I asked him a couple of questions. I asked him, so um, when were you appointed? I was appointed in June. Have you had meetings? Yes, we had one meeting, it was virtual. Have you met the chairperson or the chairman? No, I haven't. Um, I've spoken with him once or twice. Uh, have you met the CEO and uh, had a chat with him? No. We only met at that board meeting. Have you had any induction? No, we haven't had any induction because of COVID. Um, have you met any of the, the heads of department? Uh, have they given you documents, uh, the, the board charters and the board this and the board the other, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, he said they've sent some documents that I haven't looked at them. Have they given you the strategy document? No, they haven't. So I said to him, my friend, the first thing that you really need to do is to just make sure Take it upon yourself to ensure that you are fully inducted into this space so that you understand the organization that you've, uh, on whose board you've been appointed. If you don't understand, ask questions. The role of board members is to ask questions until you fully grasp what this is all about. There's no shortcut to that. There's no shortcut to reading those documents. There's no shortcut to sitting down with the heads of departments and CEO and committee chairpersons uh, etc. There's no there's no shortcut to looking at those strategy documents. Uh, there's no shortcut to asking questions if you don't understand, and that is the only way that you will uh, you'll get in, uh, into the mood uh, of or, and, and and be an effective board member, because every industry is different, every board is different, the dynamics are different because there are different personalities sitting on those boards, and for you to be effective, you've got to understand bring yourself to a level where you can understand all these things. It will not happen on day one or in month one or month two. It may even take you a whole year to do this, but it's an investment that is, that is worth, uh, well worth doing if you are going to, uh, to be effective on that board for the three years that you're appointed or even more, uh, more years because the sectors can be very, very complex. Uh, and and that, is, that rose is, uh, is my answer to that. There's no shortcut to investing uh, in knowledge, in understanding the industry that you're going into. S some of these are questions that you may be asked before you join the board, but you'll be, you'll be dealing with them at a superficial level. But once you go in there, you need to invest time and effort to really understand this and ask questions. Don't feel, don't feel stupid. Don't feel that you're making mistakes or looking stupid when you do that, because if you don't do that, you don't understand what you're getting yourself into. Patricia? I completely concur. In fact, the examples you gave are exactly uh, the journey you need to take. Because the minute you join a board, and I see there's somebody who's actually made uh, a comment to, to that end, um, you have to do that induction. And if they're not making the time for you, you have to force it and say, I need that induction. You have to sit with a chairman and ask him, what is his view? How does he see? How does he see you working? What is his sense of the board and, and everything else? You have to sit down with the MD, listen to him and what is his vision for the company? How, how, what is his team? What does it look like? Because that is a way you first start to get an in and a sense of what that organization is. And then it doesn't really matter what sector it is because at the end of the day, the way boards work, they do a skill uh, matrix 
and they sit down and they say, okay, and, and, and I mean, these are the very professional boards, which I'd imagine that is what we should all aspire to be a part of. And when they do that skill board, the, the board matrix on the skills required for that board, you are brought in to fill in a particular skill. And therefore, the minute you're on that board, you have to bring to the party that skill you have, irrespective of the sector. So if I look at what uh, skill do I generally bring, because I sit uh, across uh, a cross sector of, of um, uh, boards from, from a bank to um, a donor, multi-funded donor organization, to I was also on an agency. It was really around enterprise building and SME, how we support SME. So because that is a skill you're bringing, then the question should never be, how do you fit in or what do you do? Because it is who you are. Now it's a question of how do you apply it? But to apply it and to add value to that board, you have to understand who they are, where they are, and how you're going to be able to make that contribution. So there is absolutely no shortcut um, to getting yourself appraised and to getting yourself inducted and really to immersing yourself in that organization. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, now, a lot of the times we, we struggle around getting into boards. And yet for some people, it's very easy. I mean, I imagine the number of calls, uh, Martin and Patricia, you get to be able to join this board or the other board. Um, what's your advice around personal branding to be able to attract the right kind of boards so that then we can be able to add value. What is it about you people that stand out that perhaps uh, you know it doesn't quite happen for the other people? And Patricia, we can start with you. I know you're passionate about personal branding. So let's hear your thoughts. Why are people after you? Um, okay. I guess um, when, when I start, I'll, I'll take a step back and start to look at um, this conversation around personal branding and um, how you start to get yourself to be known for a particular area, a particular skill. So I think for me, that's the first thing you should start to build. Um, what is your area of speciality? If you come in as a jack of all trades and master of none, then it even becomes very difficult for a board because as I said, boards have a certain number of skill sets that they're looking for. And when they're recruiting, they're recruiting for people to fit that skill set. So even as they're looking for you, it's because they know you can, you meet that skill set. So you take a step back and start to ask yourself, what do I bring? What is the one thing that I want to be known for? If that is what I want to be known for, then it means you're building everything, your career, your profile, your CV to be known for that. So that when people are looking for somebody with that skill set, you are the go-to person. But let me take then another step back and say, okay, you've done that for yourself. It's one thing to have that, but people have to know that that exists. And this is where I think in another webinar, I don't know how many people are on this. Um, in the last uh, Women on Boards uh, webinar that I I was presenting at, I talked to some of the things that you need to do um, to make sure um, you get known and you, you, you people have an awareness that you're available to sit on boards. One of the things that you've done, of course, is being a member of Women on Boards because then the opportunities are there, you get to see them, and then you have at least an awareness of what exists so that you can put yourself out there. But that is not enough. I have always told women that, um, in alluding to the boys club, the boys club is not necessarily people sitting at a bar um, having drinks. It is uh, also a virtual club of people know who know each other. So when it comes to referencing and people asking, oh, I'm looking for so and so, who do you know? Because you're within that um, set, the, 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 how would I put it, the group of people they reference to and they refer to, then you get referred. Um, and that's how those boys, they all knew each other, even whether they played golf or not. You know, oh, okay, in, 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 when I was growing up, I remember um, the luminaries on boards, the Richard Kimoli, the Oburas, everything. I mean, they all knew each other. So when a new board came, who do they bring? They brought, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Richard would be a good one, bring that. So how do you replicate that today? 
And the message I gave was that you need to find champions. Um, champions are people who currently sit on boards and who have the visibility of boards and you have to make them be your champion so that they know you're available. I sit down and I tell people, I, I meet people say, I wanna be on a board. And I say, but who knows? Who have you told that you want to owe? Nobody, I didn't know, but I'm telling you now. I'm like, yes, but it has to be deliberate. If you wanna be on boards, you have to let people know that you're available to sit on a board and what you can offer. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways to do that is identify the champions the people who are sitting at the right place, who would be aware of you and who are sitting someplace and they're being asked for a name and they can remember, oh my goodness, they so and so I know who can add value. So find your champion and preferably find that champion. Um, do not limit it to women, limit it to both a male and a, a female, but also make sure they have the right networks which allow them to have access or to be sitting in a room where a referral, referrals happen. So that's the second thing. Women on board, find yourself a champion. I think those are the two things that I think um, really help because the minute you're in, then there's visibility and people know of you. And before you know it, um, you know, the references come in. If you look at a lot of the women who sit on the private boards, I promise you, I know all of them. And um, it, it also becomes easier when somebody's making a reference the minute you get your toe into one, because then after that, the ball is like moss rolling down a hill. Then you're proven. Since you're proven, oh yeah, she was on that one. Yeah, she sat on a board before. Yeah, that's a good person. So get on networks like Women on Boards, which you are now, find yourself a champion. Okay, find yeah. yourself a champion. Go on, Martin. If, yeah, <clears throat> if I could just add, and, and I agree exactly, completely with what, uh, what Patricia said. So <clears throat> if I speak for myself, I started off life as an accountant and therefore, uh, and, and rose through the ranks um, and was finance director at, 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 uh, at, uh, at Barclays years back as, as, an, as uh, an executive director. And so when people invite me to boards, uh, they look at me with that prism. So they say, for example, we want somebody who can chair our board audit committee. And that person needs to understand finances and therefore he needs to be an accountant and who, who can we see around and they, they land on my name and, and uh, you know, uh, it's indeed true that on, on all the boards that I sit on, I'm on the audit committee, right? But that's because of that kind of professional uh, strength that, uh, that, they, that they see in me. But subsequent to that, they then look at me uh, in the space of leadership and they say, yeah, this fellow here, um, we've seen a track record of leadership and we're looking for somebody who can strengthen that on, the, on our board and they invite me uh, on that basis. Some of them would be inviting me because they think that I've got some networks that might be useful to that particular organization. And therefore, uh, that, that, is, that is one of the, the things there. So, that, so if, you, if you were to say to me, so why do you sit on all these boards? A lot of that would come into play, uh, plus the fact that I've now built uh, a, a, a track record uh, in, 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 that, in that place. But, if you are coming into these boards for the first time and we're trying to brand yourself, what I'm seeing today, for if I look at the last three years, uh, the boards that I sit on, whenever we are looking for somebody, A, we are looking for a lady, B, we are looking for a young lady, C, we are looking for a lady who has got uh, some kind of technology, digital type background, uh, or we are looking for a lady who has got some risk type background. Uh, and the point here is that keeping, keeping abreast with what are those latest things that are happening uh, in the economy, in the world, and which impact these organizations and for which they would like to have expertise. So it might require you to expand your body of knowledge beyond what your primary uh, specialization is just to get uh, aware of some of these other things that, are, that might, be, might be required in the boardroom as you move forward. And then the question of networks is quite important as has been said by, by Patricia and the whole thing about champions and ensuring that you're on the databases of some of these uh, champions so that they can speak for you, they can bring up your name when this conversation come, comes up. Because some of these conversations come up uh, very, very ad hoc. You are sitting with somebody and says, ah, I'm looking for a board member for this place. 
and you have no clue at that point who, who to, whose name to bring up just because you don't know. So the more you broaden that circle of champions, uh, I would say that the better your chances are as, as well, in addition to the other things that, uh, that have been said. And, and lastly, Rose, you know, if I just go back into my own history, a lot of it for me started with volunteerism. I was volunteering in a lot of um, committees, uh, associations, uh, little boards which are not paying anything. And because of that, uh, you begin to get experience, but also people begin to see you, uh, you create that visibility. And therefore, um, you know, you are able to get onto people's minds when they're looking for, uh, for board members. Mm. Okay. Um, so Patricia, you talked about champions. I know in, in our previous life, we used to call them sponsors, but sponsors have got a different connotation now. So we'll call them champions for now. <laughs> so we have a question here from one of the members is, uh, you know, how do you identify these um, champions? And, um, and on what should that conversation, you know, feel like? So I don't know Martin, but I think Martin can get me on board. So where do I start? And how do we have the conversation? Oh, where you start is a place is like being on this webinar today <laughs> and um, creating a connection with somebody who you know can be your champion. I think um, the, the truth is, I mean, um, there's a limit to how many um, champions Martin can, can, can be for, how many I can handle or how many Catherine can. But I think it's a question of identifying somebody who you have a, a connection with and who you know has got those networks, sits on boards, and ask them to be your champion. Um, because um, I always tell um, a lot of um, women who I meet who ask me the same question, I tell them, just give me your name, yeah? And um, let me have your CV. So I actually have on my phone um, uh, uh, a note, not, not actually a note, it's actually, well, let's call it a note. And in it, I've got all the women who I'm, you know, who I know I believe in, I've met, who've asked me that they want to be on board. And because I also believe that they are, um, they can do it, I put their name. So what happens is every time I'm sitting somewhere and uh, people ask me for a name, which happens, I promise you, once every couple of months, if not, then I can go to this wonderful list, look at the name, look at the area they're strong in, and then I'm able to, to recommend them. So finding champions is not a question of just picking anybody. You have to find somebody who at least has, knows you a little bit, who has that network, that connection, who um, you know will have, um, you know, because I think for me also, I, I'd like to know you a little bit because there's nothing worse than um, telling, asking me to champion you and I don't know you. Because remember, again, this is all a question of reputation. By the time you're recommending something, somebody, um, there's something that says about you. So nobody wants to recommend somebody who they don't know. Um, because if there's something that you didn't know that comes up, imagine how it looks um, for you. And I'm just being very, very candid here. So ideally, what you need to do is if it's somebody I know or you know, I'm, I'm prepared and we're prepared to make that connection, I'm always very happy to take the names. I keep them down. What is your area? What's your interest? What's your experience and your CV? So when I'm sitting somewhere, I'm able to offer your name. So identify somebody who at least has an awareness of who you are. Identify somebody who, of course, has been on some, sits on some boards because um, they're already in the party so they can invite you in. Um, and somebody um, who I guess is, is actually prepared um, to do that. And more than anything else, I think um, this Women on Boards Network is also very, very powerful. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Um, while I let you and Martin uh, grab a cup or a glass of water, I know it's Friday, so yes, we do accept that you can actually have a glass of wine as well. Um, we do have two interns with us all the way from University of Columbia. They're interning virtually at Women, Women on Boards Network this fall. And these are Madeleine Dijin and DG Lee. So I'll quickly welcome them uh, to the webinar to just put their videos on, 
tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing for women on boards before we come to the final thoughts and comments from Patricia and Martin. So Madeline, are you on the call? Yep, I'm right here. Hi. Everyone. Oh, hi. Hello. Um, thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be on this call. I, I absolutely loved the um, conversation and uh, kind of seeing the, uh, well, something I thought about this entire time was, you know, in the United States, we serving tea is not a thing. We don't drink tea. It's not part of our culture. But the underlying nuances of what it represents to serve a cup of tea on a Kenyan board really resonates with some of the challenges that women face in the workplace in the United States. So, um, yeah, it was very interesting. And I'm uh, looking forward to, to being working with the Women on Boards Network and getting to know the members and panelists and, um, yeah, working to, to expand the network and the great work that, that you all do. Okay, thank you, Madeline. Um, I hope you learned a little bit of Swahili. Yes, I, I know a little bit already. I spent some time in Kenya a few years ago, and so um, it's coming back to me a, a teeny bit. <laughs> All right, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to working with you as you intern with us. Thank you very much. Um, DG, are you on the call? Yes, I'm here. Okay, perhaps you could put on your video so we can see you. Yeah, here. Can, can you, oh, can great. You? Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm DG. Uh, I'm a third year student at Columbia studying human rights. Uh, yeah, I really love to be here. I really enjoyed the conversation about the, especially about the, the boys club and the tea, because it, it well, I'm originally from Korea and it remind me of my time in the, the women's rights organization and we we don't ha we don't have the tea thing, but we do have coffee thing, which is you know, really similar. And uh, yeah, it it really remind me of the time. And I I guess I could drop my two cents, which is like, uh, well, like you know, it, you can't just avoid to serve the tea. However, like because you when when the gas comes, you do have to serve something, and usually it's. Uh, in Korea, at least, it's I think it's gotten better. Usually, the intern that serves, serves the tea nowadays, and uh, I one of the one of the recommendations that I heard was quite interesting was that uh, you know when when you are told the, if you believe that, that was you're you're told that be based on your gender, then you just could like refer to someone who has a lower lower rank. That was kind of interesting uh, recommendation. I, th I think it really works out though. And uh, about the boys club, when um, uh, I, I may call you by first name because I don't want to mispronounce your last name. Uh, Patricia said about the boys club, you, know, you got to get involved in order to really like get in the field because well, in Korea, we do have the military service, compulsory military service where guys serve. So usually the conversation about within guys are all about the military and women can't really relate to that. And, uh, but like one of the, one of the conversation that we, that I had with, and within the women's rights NGO was, you know, you still have, you, you still can't go in. Although you, you don't have any experience within the conversation, relate to the conversation, but you can still get involved and like, at least like have some like reaction to it, which, will make you really in and uh, and I think that also is related to the, the tea conversation because you know well like as as long as you're involved then they they're not going to ask you to serve tea they will ask you to you know work instead of you know just serving the tea if oh, that absolutely. makes sense absolutely yeah, absolutely. yeah. That, yeah that's well, thank it. you DJ. sorry that, there you go. I said thank you. That was it. Okay. All right. So thank you, DJ. We look forward to uh, engaging with you. Um, I, I realize that you mentioned you're from South Korea, so it must be a lot of interesting things to learn from that part of the world. So we welcome you to Women on Boards. All right. Because Martin, you seem to be the minority um, within our membership this evening. We will request that you Take the first call to give us your final thoughts and perhaps, you know, any tips that you may not have shared 
but can give to us as uh, women on boards. And in particular, you know, some of the conversations that happen within the boardroom. So any final thoughts before we can give Patricia and then finally close the session? So uh, first, obviously, to just uh, thank you for inviting me here today. And uh, <clears throat> it's been quite um, a learning experience for me as well, just uh, sitting um, in with uh, more than 115 women and, and, and kind of just listening to what's to what their thoughts are and the perspective from uh, from that, starting from that very simple concept of to serve or not to serve tea. Uh, so thank you for inviting me. Uh, also, just to um, encourage everybody on this call because uh, you know times have changed sub substantially, and uh, women on boards is the in thing now for many reasons. Um, least of which, obviously, is what we have been discussing today: the value that women bring. Uh, onto these boards and trying to break this uh, this previously men only club uh, of of boards. Uh, also, to say that uh, you know, working to get yourself uh, onto the board. I mean, be, sitting on boards is not uh, not a bed of roses. Actually, um, it's a, a real it's a real challenge because the issues that boards deal deal with these days are very, very difficult issues. And therefore, having the right, the right mindset, preparing yourself fully um, and convincing yourself that this is what you want to do, which obviously you want to do now that you're on these webinars. Many of you already sit on boards anyway, uh, but just taking it as one of those investments that you must do so that you are really prepared to participate and add value once you get uh, onto those boards. And, uh, you know, uh, finally, you know, and just ensure that you keep raising your hand from time to time, uh, the right networks, have, as we've been discussed, uh, trying to be in the right place at the right time. And once you get on, on really making your contribution uh, as a board member, uh, and not necessarily as a woman sitting on that board, but as a board member, obviously being very much aware about the unique things that you bring into the boardroom. Uh, but once you are inside there, don't get cowed by anybody. And I can tell you that on the boards that I sit, the women there don't get cowed by anybody. They are really powerful, strong voices uh, who cannot be silenced. So thank you very much, uh, Rose. And best wishes to you all. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for always being supportive of the women agenda. Uh, we, we really appreciate you. And please don't tire every time we do make the call. We hope that... Um, you will say yes. So thank you very much. Uh, Patricia, your final thoughts? Um, um, thank you so much again. I mean, it's always a pleasure to try and bring together your thoughts in, in a conversation like this and um, to be able to share it um, in a way that is not academic, but in a way that um, is authentic and really um, you know, gives insight and, you know, helps anybody who wants to go on this journey um, do it in a, with a slower or shorter learning curve, if I may use that expression. So my final thoughts are that, um, as uh, Martin has said, and I have said several times, never want something because you're a woman. Want it because of what you bring, what is the value you bring and never ever compromise your standards uh, from that perspective. If as a woman, you, you know, add a, a different dimension, yes, support a different agenda, which is usually diversity, fantastic. But never allow yourself to Don't be- Don't take all of it. Okay. Uh, um, to, to, to be, um, you know, to subscribe to tokenism because that is really um, shortchanging yourself and who you are. The second thing is, um, having said that, I'm going to say something that sounds a little paradoxical. On the other hand, never try and not be a woman because there's a reason why we're created and the world was created with a male gender and a female gender because there's something that um, each of us brings. So in the conversation that we started with around serving tea and not serving tea, don't let it become a fight right? Because when it becomes a fight or when it becomes something that undermines who you are and what you, you bring is if you yourself 
have not uh, allowed yourself to build your confidence and to be recognized for the, um, the value that you bring. So to the points that I raised, yes, start the way you intend to go, which is, you know, be prepared, come in with a voice, make sure you have the presence, make sure that you're inducted well and you're coming in with that background and confidence. Therefore, if one day you serve tea, fantastic. If the next day you serve tea, fantastic. Because what you're trying to do is create an environment where there's collegiality and there's equality from a contribution that each individual is, is bringing, a recognition that there's equality in the persons who are sitting there, not the genders who, who are sitting there. And um, finally, my, my, my last thought is uh, that um, the points I raise as, as, as women, please take them to heart. Um, don't see them as, um, oh my God, in this world where we're trying to make sure, you know, um, you, you know we, we can be, we can do what we want. By all means, do that. But the message I was giving when I was saying, talking to your ability to lean in, your ability to um, be succinct, to think through what you have to say and your ability to always be comfortable in your skin was because once you get to that place, then it allows you to be the best person that you can be. There is no distractions. You are allowing yourself to bring out the best of who you can be. So don't handicap yourself by creating distractions which actually um, do not count or do not exist. So with that, I say thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. And, um, you know, uh, I, I love this because then it allows me to really reflect on my journey and my experiences and something which a lot of times because of the life we live, the pace we live, we never really have that opportunity to do that. And just to, if any of you just take out even one thing from this conversation, I think it will have been time well spent for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia and Martin. You know what they say, when women support each other, great things happen. So this webinar will not be complete without the voice of one special lady. So Catherine, um, are you on the call? Perhaps you can say jumbo to the members and give us your final thoughts as well before we say goodnight. Wow, thank you very, very much, Rose. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Patricia. What a way to end a week. What a way to start a weekend. I have taken away so, so much from this conversation. Uh, great lessons indeed. I keep learning every day from Martin, from Patricia. And that's why we keep calling you back because we can't get enough uh, out of you. And, and I think for me, the one thing that I've taken away is develop that brand of yourself. Once you're comfortable in your skin, it doesn't matter that they ask you to serve tea. It's not going to take away anything from you. And for me, that is what is so, so powerful. I want to thank everyone for joining this call uh, today. I think it's been um, a very, very, very good conversation. Thank you, Rose, for your moderation. And I want to invite everyone who is on this call who is not a member of Women on Boards, please do join Women on Boards. And please do remember, Wanjiru, please, thank you. Um, please do remember that we have two categories of membership, uh, the junior membership, which is uh, age 12, uh, right up to after university. And then after, after that, we have the main membership. So please do join. And, and last but not least, I just want to say that we have um, board profiling and personal positioning um, workshop, which is coming up uh, next month, this month. So please uh, join, uh, get in touch with Hannah, get in touch with Mrs. Wanga. They'll be able to give you um, information about that workshop, which I think is so, so important, particularly for those of you who are looking to join boards. And as I end, I just want to appeal once more to those of us who are serving on boards that we should remain true to the calling that we got to serve on those boards. We should remain true to ourselves. We should remain true um, to the calling to serve because 
serving on a board is indeed service uh, in the true sense of the word. Thank you so much and back to you, uh, Rose. Thank you, Catherine, for those words. Um, yes, we do appreciate you um, as part of the leadership and I urge members to truly uh, participate in some of these conversations. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, members, for joining. You know what they say, individually, we are a drop. Together, we form an ocean. So let's keep lifting each other up. It's Friday evening. Enjoy your weekend. Enjoy your Friday. And don't forget to keep safe. COVID is still with us. Thank you all. And have a good night. Bye. Good night. Thank you, Rose. Good Thank night. you, Martin. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Patricia. Bye -bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank Bye -bye. you, Martin. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.